Hello there, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Cross's Corner. And with me is Tom George. Hi, Tom. Hello, Martin. How are you? Yeah, pretty good, actually. Really stoked to be talking to you on uh, Cross's Corner this evening. Um, and you've had a very busy day, I know. You're packing to go on camp tomorrow. Uh, talk to me about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so tomorrow we're off to... Yeah. Do a bit of altitude training, all land training based, all land based stuff. So, uh, we yeah, we leave tomorrow morning. It's quite exciting. Um, tell us about that camp because it was a big thing under Jurgen, wasn't it? The the Sierra Nevada camp. Yeah, it's, it's sort of been a, a staple in the British rowing calendar. I think for a couple of a few cycles. Well, basically, yeah, all of Jurgen's time. Um, I think the Spanish Olympic Association built it for the '92 Olympics for Barcelona. So it's been around for a while. Um, and they haven't updated a single thing there. So, um, to, yeah, looking a bit ready around the edges. But um, being a yeah, big part of the, the, the sort of Jürgen calendar, we always go in in December time, actually, and then go somewhere a bit warmer in January. So, um, it's going to be a bit of a shock to the system. But I've heard that there's no snow in Europe. So, anywhere in Europe, I've heard that no one can get a skiing holiday anywhere. So, maybe it'll be a sort of balmy Spanish weather. How many times have you done it, Tom? Uh, so I did it once as a development athlete in twenty, would have been January seventeen, and then uh, December eighteen, December nineteen, and then December twenty. Oh no, we didn't do it December twenty, obviously because of the pandemic. So uh, just the pandemic, this yeah. my sort of fourth time there, I think. Yeah, fourth one. And have you forgotten how hard it is? Because I, I mean, we've seen pictures of grown oarsmen weeping at mm. the camp. Yeah, uh, no, definitely haven't forgotten how hard it is. I think it's probably in terms of like the 15 day block, the hardest thing we do is five session a day. Well, you basically just have to like sleep and uh, train, sleep, train, sleep, train, repeat, um, try and squeeze in a little bit of, you know, maybe a walk down into the town because there is a ski resort sort of directly next to it or actually slightly below uh... it. So you can go down there and have a pizza or something like that on a half day, which is quite nice. Uh, just see a little bit of the world, but uh, ultimately, yeah, you're there just to train and to just grind yourself into the floor a little bit. And that very much is like the protocol of the camp. Yeah. So um, tell us about your day today. How many sessions did you have? Uh, today was just a couple because of travel tomorrow. We uh, yeah. just uh, two this morning, just to, like, yeah, getting back into it. We trained yesterday, trained today as a squad. Obviously, did a bit of training over the Christmas break. We get. 10 days off but you're never fully off are you ultimately um so you're just always like taking something along a little bit whether it's you know i went out on my bike a little bit and just really enjoyed riding the bike and being able to sort of mix up a modality um obviously the weather was actually quite nice uh, it got a bit windy towards the end but i was able to just ride my parents live in the cotswolds so i was back there i was able to just like ride around the cross cotswolds and uh to visit some old routes that i sort of got to know quite well during the 2020 lockdown yeah yeah was that the same place you were during um, when you broke the world record, uh, the British record on the 2K? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back in that shed, um, just enjoying sort of being back there. I don't know. I guess it's nice. I've, I've, we've got an erg at home and there's a watt bike. So you kind of, and then I've got my road bike. So there is actually quite a nice sort of mix of things to be able to do. It does make it quite easy to sort of go down and train. And I don't mind it too much, you know, when, uh, yeah, in the mornings, just sort of get up and crack on and do, do a little something just to sort of start the day. Yeah. Did you get on the yoga at all in the last 10 days? Yeah, yeah, uh, fair amount. Yeah. And, and tell us what sort of work you're doing on it. Uh, um, just doing a bit of, I call it like a bit of a Rob Baker special from the Cambridge days, but just do like a, basically like an 18K erg and then just get straight on the bike for an hour, on the what bike for an hour, or like go on the roads for 90 minutes or two hours or so. So just like, try and keep it as a like a one sessioner um so if you just do it in so as an indoor session it's two hours basically two hours of aerobic work um and you just that little break in between bang on some bib shorts and uh, get a little bit of water in and some and a little bit of food just to make sure that you're not gonna completely yeah. die whilst doing that session but it's just a, it's quite a nice way to sort of basically cover what 30 k's worth of distance yeah 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 did you have any days off uh, yeah, a couple. Um, I think it's important. So, yeah, I had a couple of days off just around Christmas time. Um, just obviously both my brothers live in the US, so they were both back. So it was nice to be able to catch up with them and uh, and have a couple of days of just, you know, some good food and um, a couple of beers, just sort of sit back and, and, and relax a little bit. Yeah. 
<clears throat> now, I gather trials, the winter trials or December trials were postponed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you never got to row in your pair again yeah. Yeah. with Ollie. Well, yeah, we haven't yet. Um, done a few sessions, maybe here and there, but not too much, which is uh, fine. Um, and like we've just been like back in the program, I think getting used to being back at Cavisham. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities for us to go out in the pair um, at some point. But uh, yeah, I think the focus has been elsewhere, really, um, which is uh, all part of it and all part of sort of integrating back in from being at Cambridge for the year. Did that feel strange at all coming back into the program from Cambridge? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think obviously there's a bigger group. There's a yeah, bigger group of guys. So you, uh, there's a lot more. Um, you've got to, like a lot more moving parts, got more logistics involved. Um, obviously, when we were at Cambridge, it was quite nice. Just we had sort of up to the boat race, obviously, you're doing the boat race stuff, and, and that's a lot of fun and totally unique and different challenge. And you do all the fixtures and you have trial aids and you. You know, you're on a slightly different schedule to the rest of the national team guys. And then um, once we were in our pair, it was just like the three of us. And it was nice. We were able to be quite flexible with each other. You know, we obviously were full study full study mode, like heads down as well. So yeah. um, that was like a totally unique challenge, but it meant that we had to sort of fit the training around that. So sometimes it'd be bang out to Ely early, early, do a long row, come back and then just fit in an erg when you could in the day. And sometimes it would be, let's go to Ely twice, do two sessions and come back and study all afternoon. Um, but it was nice being able to like just just, just talk as a trio and, and figure out the best way for us to, to do that. And obviously now we're sort of back into the, the sort of bigger melting pot. Um, and we haven't been in the past, so it's all obviously a bit different. Um, yeah. But you sort of become aware of um, uh, like the smaller group there, you are able to be a little bit more flexible. Yeah. <clears throat> What did Rob Baker bring to you as a coach? Uh, yeah. Uh, people ask me this a lot, actually. Do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I think they, they want to know, like people want to know, and I think uh, perspective, like people looking at the boat race actually are quite fascinated by it, like guys who want to go and do the boat race and are sitting there and sort of asking how, like what Rob did with us and they want to know. Um, I think uh, what well, thing I really liked about Rob was like the soft skills side of things. Like obviously he's a fantastic coach, but the big part I remember when we first got in the pair he was like I'm not going to sit here and tell you how to row a boat you both know how to row a boat you've both been to the Olympics um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of training we're going to train really hard and if there's something glaringly obvious obviously we're going to discuss that and change it but we're going to make sure that we like are very focused on what we want from each session uh, and so that was like one of the things we did was just always before every session it was like this is the focus for the session and then go and do it um and then i think just like understanding that you have co classes and coursework and you have um sort of a life outside of rowing i think he was very yeah. good at that and very good at understanding when you know he could like read you very well i think he read the two of us very well and managed us both very well and saw when you know one of us might have been struggling or like one of us clearly had a lot on outside of yeah. rowing, whether that's with school or whatever and was able to just like put the arm around you and be like okay let's just calm down a little bit here um, and I think that that was like one of the nicest things for us as a, as a trio, just being able to sort of understand it. And so it's like now I just sort of see Rob as a, as a mate as much as anything. And yeah. you know, especially when Cambridge is down training on the Tideway, like I live up in Hammersmith. I love going down there and uh, just like catching up with him, catching up with uh, all the guys in the squad and um, just sort of seeing him. And, and I, there's no point, I think we sort of broke down quite well that like, a hierarchical um, relationship and it was just like the three of us working yeah, together yeah. on the project. It was very collaborative and that was just awesome. I want to talk a little bit more about that, but uh, Giovanni Ippolito, uh, Ippolito has asked a question here watching us. Hi Giovanni, hope you're enjoying the show tonight. Uh, what was the difference between Princeton and Cambridge? Yeah, all right. that's another, yeah, another question I think I've sort of thought about quite a lot and, and mulled over is that... Um, Obviously, at Cambridge, I was quite a lot older, just in a one-year program. Um, whilst at Princeton, it's like the undergrad system. And then in the States, sports is just sort of built into the undergrad system. So, you know, at Princeton, every day from 4.30 to 7.30, there was no academic classes. It was at sports time. And if you weren't an athlete, that was like study time. Ah. Um, and so it, almost like being at school, it was like built into the way that you, you know, it was considered a part of your education if you're doing sports. Like Princeton's unofficial motto was education through athletics on the athletic side of things. Oh, really? Yeah. And so um, 
it was a massive part of like the lifeblood of the college as, as, as much as anything. And so um, it, it felt like, you know, everyone was working together, it was considered part of your education. So it was never sort of held against you to be like rowing or playing lacrosse or whatever your sport was. And so um, uh, that aspect of it, I think, was was quite nice. I think at Cambridge, uh, I was very lucky. My supervisor was, was a really, really great guy. And um, uh, he's actually, I think, nationally ranked as a cyclist. Uh, oh, really? Time trial cyclist over, over 60s or over 65s. Um, and so he, we, we used to talk quite a lot about sort of cycling, rowing, you know, endurance sports. And I think he really sort of enjoyed that. Um, so I was very lucky in that regard that he was, uh, he was in my corner because there were definitely professors at Cambridge who very much thought that, you know, it was my choice to be a rower, but that, that was like, you know, potentially to my hindrance in terms yeah. of what I could be spent studying, spending studying. So, um, I think those were two of the things that just very, like the most obvious things in terms of like fitting the rowing into your training schedule. So it means that like you go rowing at Cambridge, we were getting regularly, you're on the five thirty train from Cambridge to Ely in the morning <laughs> with, with all these undergrads, all these guys. And, and it brings you together as a team, certainly, but it's really interesting that, you know, obviously the earliest we'd train at Princeton would be like a 7 a.m. if we wanted to do something before yeah. classes, which started at nine. Um, and then I guess on the sort of academic side of things, um, it's sort of hard to speak to really because I was doing a master's program at Cambridge, but very much it was like a single track focus yeah. on my master's whilst uh, the U.S. college system with like liberal arts colleges is just, you know, the sort of broad church of um, dipping your toe into a lot of different things and trying things out and then obviously majoring. But um, being having the flexibility to try different topics that might might sort of entertain you and, and or, or sort of pique your interest. Yeah, yeah. Who was your coach at Princeton? Uh, Greg Hughes. Oh, and how did that go? Yeah, good. good. I get on really well with Greg. Um, really, really enjoy catching up with him. We catch up quite regularly throughout the year. Um, yeah, I, lo- I, I loved running at Princeton. I loved the like, guys on the team. Um, I think we maybe had some missed opportunities, which is a shame, but uh, in terms of rowing, but and results but you know I guys in that team who I just sort of love catching up with and it's always great when we go to World Cups because all Worlds or International Regattics because there are so many of them like across the international field there's so many Princeton Tigers across the international field that you're able to catch up with and I just that's really cool and it's something yeah I'd never trade yeah 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 how long did it take you to get in the one V boat oh I raced in it all, all um, yeah all four years so oh really yeah I think I was the second year that you were able to do that, I think I was the first, the second year that you didn't have to do a freshman. Yeah. Yeah. How did it work being part, because there was a time, I remember um, someone like Matt Benstead was agonising over whether he should stay yeah. in the British system or go to Princeton. Yes. Yeah. Um, how did it work? Because you did under 23s, I think, in three years running, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So I did uh, 14, 15, 16. Under 23s, uh, I think, like I did juniors in 2012. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think when I was doing juniors, there definitely wasn't a positive feeling towards it from the sort of British rank hierarchy, but that's obviously mm. changed a lot now. Um, I think it's a really cool opportunity for people. And I think that if that opportunity comes to anyone, they should take it because it's pretty life changing. You know, there's really cool, uh, you meet amazing people. Yeah. Um, the sort of academics can depending on where you end up but it's sort of unparalleled and um uh just like really cool opportunity to do something a bit different compared with you know just sort of the usual pathways and then ultimately it's the spending gap isn't it you know when you go to princeton or yale or cal or washington and you've got the most incredible facilities everywhere and everything's taken care of and you know like i know at washington i live with jacob dawson he was a Washington Husky like, yeah. um, he talks about how the athlete dining room was in the top floor of the boathouse so it was literally like to put the boats on the rack go have a shower and change and you're in you're in dinner 15 minutes later wow. and it's all, it's all made for you and so um, yeah I think the you know, little things like that just just make it that bit more professional and just like improve your sort of progression along the, the pathway a little bit quicker yeah so you you'd say that definitely helped make you the athlete you are today Oh, for sure. Yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. And uh, talk to me about Pete Shep. Did he have much to do with your development through and pathway into the under-23s? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Shep was like the big uh, 
So Shep runs the, for people that don't know, Shep runs the uh, pathway, the GB pathway from juniors under 23s into the senior team. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely instrumental. And I think, uh, what year was it? It must be 2016. He came out and visited Princeton. And I think mm-hmm. he visited lots of schools in the US um, and just sort of like saw it all, got to put his sort of get a finger on the pulse of, of what it what it's about and, you know, why all these uh, young athletes from from the like Great Britain system want to go over there. Um, so he he did that and and Shep was like your go-to. And honestly, Shep still is one of my go-tos, to be honest. Like, yeah. He's one of the people I, I talk to Shep quite regularly, actually, even now, um, sort of five years into being in the team. So... Yeah, I get on very well with Shep and, and I think that he's very good at identifying people and, and like pushing people in the right way. Yeah, yeah. What did you have to do to get into Princeton? Presumably you had to post something like a 2K score or um, trials yeah, so, results. Yeah, so I did Junior Worlds in 2012 and then got recruited the like following autumn. Okay. Um, so that was probably the big on the water result and then I think I was a 608 at the time and then... I'd already been recruited, but in my last year of school, went 6.03, I think. Whoa. Yeah, so those were my two scores back then. That, um, But it was like the 6.08 was the one that I sort of got recruited on, yeah. Have you always been good on the earth then? Has that always been your yeah, I think Yeah, I think so. I think always just like, uh, yeah, pair of lungs, really, because I can't lift anything in the gym, so. <laughs> Are you kidding? Really? No, yeah, I'm, yeah, weak as anything, so, yeah. So, so um, talk to me about, are you a, a 2K man or a 5K man? Or do you see yourself yeah. as not bothering between the two now? Um, yeah, I guess ultimately I don't really, I can't, I can't really sit here and be like, oh, sort of bother between two. Um, I think 2K is interesting because I think you have less, a smaller window within a season where you're probably on to PB. Yeah. Because it's, you know, like... I'm not going to say the stars need to align for you. That's not right because you sort of create your own luck, but um, you need to make sure that you've done enough stuff at like that threshold and at that intensity and, and you've been able to build into it. Whilst the 5K, I think, um, just because of the nature of it being a bit longer, a bit ultimately, you're obviously going a bit slower. Um, just especially last year, for example, like the boat race training, it's just like every weekend we were doing, what was it, Saturday we'd do 24K and then uh, two by 3K. Yeah. Um, on the water and then uh, on Sunday you do like another 24k and then the 12k with sort of like fart leg like up and down through the intensities and I think yeah. that um, that's kind of perfect training right when you're doing 3k pieces and things like that to build into that 5k you get used to just grinding and grinding for sort of 10 minutes 12 minutes depending on if you're doing it into the stream in the wind or not and so um, yeah I think that you kind of can you have a slightly sort of bigger window, especially through a winter training block where you can probably PV in a 5k. Yeah. So it sounds like you must have planned that doing that 2k where you went sub 540 for a little bit or quite a bit. Yeah. Well, so the first time I went sub 540 was during um, lockdown. And I think that obviously we just were on the erg the whole time and we were just, that was the the sort of focus and we did quite a lot of intensity and a lot of pieces and I think I just remember being like right every time we do pieces I'm just going to make the rest shorter and shorter and every single oh, really? time we'd sit on 125 and then it was like right 125s 125s you know and I was doing like 30 seconds rest between two 1ks and stuff like that and, and um, or just doing three 1ks and just like trying to like push it as much as I could and see basically how hard you can make it um, and then the second time was uh after the lockdown it was like november or december of 2020 so after the lockdown so i kind of had that all banked but i knew exactly where i needed to be and i felt really good yeah um, yeah and then i didn't do a 2k last season so couldn't talk did to you it. not yeah we didn't do one at cambridge and then by the time it was sort of time to time to maybe consider it it was like well we got belgrade and then we got henley and then we got lucerne and all of these are basically selection races so you've got to be like we're not going to sort of waste our time here yeah, yeah. Just, to, just to prove we can still do one yeah that's fair enough you yeah. don't use uh music at all on the Erg, do you uh yeah I, I, the longer pieces definitely um the shorter pieces yeah during lockdown i did because um it's just a bit lonely uh and then um yeah steady state stuff always 30 minutes i will 5ks i will just because it's like that's quite long. I think you just need to kind of have anything you possibly can to take your mind off either the noise of the fan in front of you yeah, or just like how horrific it is. 
Um, and then the like 2Ks, it's kind of interesting. Like with 2Ks, I used to never, and then I started in lockdown. And then now I kind of have it on, but then in the last sort of 700, you can't really hear anything anyway because people are just yelling at you. So you can't <laughs> hear the music anyway. So uh, it's kind of, do you, do you really need it? I don't really know. Um, but I kind of feel like it works for me just to be like, okay, I know where I'm at. Just set onto yeah. my pace. Yeah, especially when you feel good in that first like 300 meters, you just got to like settle onto your pace rather than thinking about how good you feel. Do you, do you know, do you get a sense of when you're doing a 2K or something like that of, yeah, this is going to be, you know, a great test for me? Or is it just all pain when uh, you wait to the end result? Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's kind of both. Um, don't really necessarily think that there are bad tests. I think if you have bad tests, you're either not like prep that well for it or you've done something stupid. Um, so I'd probably mm. say that like, yeah, sometimes you miss your mark a little bit, but on the whole, it's just like on the, all in the prep and then being sensible with the way that you execute. Like rowing's the, the ultimate sport for like, there's no cheat code or no shortcuts. It's yeah. always, always, always what you've already put in is what you'll get out. Like no one's ever turned up. Okay, people might say like that, that French pair race when they won in, in Sydney where it was like, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, but like no one really turns up on the start line. Uh, and then, or no one turns up for an erg and then goes, well, uh, you know, I've been, all the pieces I've done, I've been going sort of 127, but today I might just try going out 125 and hold it for as long as I can and whoops, I've broken 540. It doesn't, it never <laughs> works like that, right? So it's always like, you know what you're, where you're at and what you're capable of. So then just execute it. And um, yeah, I don't think you should, I think, yeah, it's always going to hurt. It's always going to be absolutely brutal. Um, but ultimately you should know that and you should know how much it's going to hurt because you've prepared yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard the pain was quite a lot after that 5K world record that you did. Yeah, that was pretty horrific, actually. Um, but that was, I think, as much in, like, the 5K got away from me a little bit. Like, I was on pace, on pace, on pace for the first 3K, being like, bang, I'm right where I want to be. And then I suddenly got to, like, 1,500 to go. And I was like, wow, I might miss this. I don't think this is there. And it was a, like, weird one where I was still at 129, but I was suddenly like, oh, I kind of... So my last 500, the... 5k was like a 125.5 I think you're kidding uh, and it was just like wow I actually had and Cracknell was just standing behind me and was like you've just actually got to do something here um, and it, he, he kept saying and all the way through he would always say you've done the work you've done the work and so would Bakes they're just like they didn't say much to me I think they knew that like basically I'd sort of said that I'm going to go for it Bakes had asked me a couple of days before and I've been like yeah I'll go for it because like you know I've got nothing really to lose here um, and so then it was always just like, you've done the work. That was all they said every like K or 15, or 1500 meters. Um, and so, yeah, then it was like, actually I've had to absolutely pull myself off the floor a little bit, but I just don't really know where I, like if I look back at those splits, I don't really know where I could have made that up to make it any yeah. easier than the last 500. So yeah. ultimately that probably means it was kind of the perfect piece for that day and for where I was at in, my, in that training. Um, yeah, it took me about a week actually to feel normal again. Did it? In terms of like, like every time I got in a boat, it was like, like I was running the two seat of like a mixed eight at Cambridge doing absolutely nothing for for the week. Just like, yeah, or I'd just, we'd do, we'd go and do an erg, an erg session and they'd be like, Rob, I'm just going to sit on the bike and spin my legs. I like, they just didn't come back and didn't come back. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting sort of thing, I guess, when you have future 5Ks, I need to kind of consider that if I'm going to have another crack at it of being like, well, actually, it's not always there for you. Well, it's not like, it, it might always be there for you, but, you got to think of like if I'm got to do a five k and then it's like trials is a week later. We don't really know like how that's yeah going to yeah yeah. Up, you know, what well, are you still motivated to to have another go? I was going to ask you if if there's any any more in you. I mean, because once you've done it, that's what, obviously so fantastic. 5K? Yeah, yeah. I don't really know about the five k to be honest. I'm I'm quite motivated for two. I'd love to go five thirty eight or five thirty seven. Whoa, that'd be pretty cool because yeah. I think that. That's kind of like the 5K is really cool, but obviously it's not what we race over at the Olympics. So yeah, yeah. The 2K, like that'd be sort of nice to just like chip or at least just chip on a bit. I, what's My best now is a 39.2, so it'd be like just tuck it to like a 38.8, a 38.5, something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the 5K, I don't really know. Like uh, I guess I had to be motivated because it's part of our training schedule. So like, you know, it's pretty hard. I think we had a couple of uh, tests well i've had oak tests before where it's like these oak tests don't matter you know in terms of like selection because it's like we just want to do it it's like a site it and i think those are really hard to get up for 
Mm. And they end up being probably more horrible for not going as quickly because you've always got to respect them. And so um, I think you've always got to be motivated. You've always got to like find something. And that's even if it's just like, you know, like making something up in your head that's like riling, riling yourself up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca Caro um, from Rowan Chat is watching. And um, I'm not sure you are going to be doing LA. I kind of, in my mind, I thought you were going to do Paris and then, you know, find a job or something like that or an internship. But uh, I don't know, maybe you are. But she's asked, your the racing is 1500. How will that change training? Yeah. Um, I think 1500 is interesting. I think World Rowing have announced that, Crossy, you probably know more than me on this actually. World Rowing have announced that there no other race will shorten. Yeah, yeah, that's so, right. So it's only going to be LA, which it just makes it interesting because I can't see anyone ever altering their training schedules ultimately because you still got to win world championships every year. Your qualification is still going to be over 2K. So yeah. I don't really know how that will, will move around, to be honest, because um, I think you just like, Treat it the same, but you've got to go out a bit harder because there's no middle case. So <laughs> just yeah, taking yeah, that yeah. one in. Um, I'd be interested. I'm interested to to sort of see how it goes. Uh, you know, see what the racing is like because uh, you know whether I'm involved or not. Um, I'm just interested to know if it actually slightly ruins it because the middle K is obviously such an important part of rowing. That if it is just like wind it out, wind it in, you start to like cater towards different athletes. That being said, as we've just said, you know. The athletes that qualify the boats are obviously going to be the ones that are sort of pushing for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you, thanks for that question, Rebecca, um, was given, you know, you're so strong on the 2K and the 5K, um, and you're obviously a great rower, how come you've been in the boat in the sort of up towards the bows in three or four? I know you're in six in the boat race crew. Yeah, uh, so, yeah what, I guess you, that's a question for coaches. So, do yeah. you not ask them or do you uh, just take it? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of, yeah, I guess you, you have those conversations, but I guess you just sort of go where you're put. And it's important, like, it, you know, it's horses for courses, isn't it? And it's about setting the boat up in the best way that you can. So, um, yeah, I trust that in every boat I've been in, I've been put in the like best position for me to, to contribute towards those boats going fast. Yeah. You yeah. don't fancy being down the stern at all. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I like. Um, I guess it depends. I don't. I don't know how much I'd want to race an eight again. I ultimately, internationally, I think I've sort of done that, and I've really enjoyed racing the pair, and never really raced the four internationally. So it'd be cool to do that. And then I guess like in those situations, it's not so much about like where you're sitting. It's just like getting the boat going as well as you can. Um, yeah, I enjoyed racing in the eight. I enjoyed sitting in the three seat behind Big Mo. How many good? You know, we used to. I think it worked pretty well for us. Um, obviously, didn't quite get there at the Olympics, which was uh, like, which was obviously a shame. I think we had good lead in. Uh, we had a great Lucerne um, and a good European. So, yeah, I think you know, I just trust inherently that the coaches are trying to make the fastest boats like we are, and that you just go where you put. And I think that we were sitting in the right seats for for the race in in Tokyo. Yeah, um, I, I just want to talk to you about your international progression. Um, yeah, because that that result in 2017 must have been a it was a pretty decent result for you in the pair, wasn't it? Yeah, getting, yeah, yeah. Getting to the final. Yeah, first year in the team. Yeah, yeah, and I was still at Princeton, so I like. Uh, oh, were you? Came in for the summer and did a pairs matrix, and then did that, and then went back to Princeton for another year after. So. Oh, so uh, oh, that's interesting. So I didn't, I didn't quite realise that. So you were in Princeton when you got in the eight in twenty eighteen. I just come back, yeah. You that just was come like, back, actually, yeah. So how was that selection made then? Well, in twenty eighteen, yeah. Um, I guess like I'd gone, gone well, gone, been pretty strong. Um, Jurgen and we, when I came back, there was like you know swapping in and out of the eight, and then Jurgen was like, "This is what I think is the best boat for us to." to proceed with yeah. yeah yeah and was that bronze medal is that the best of your bronze me the best of your bronze medals um oh, yeah, there's a lot of them isn't there um <laughs> yeah um yeah I, I i think probably just in terms of the, the way that season sort of unfolded i think we that kind of was like you win it that was like a one a full like win a bronze medal and be absolutely chuffed with it yeah um so i mean i guess in terms of how you felt about it yeah um You'd have probably have to say yes. Yeah. 
just in terms of like when, when, I, when we won that bronze medal, we probably sat there and went, that's actually like a positive result. Yeah. Um, others, there's probably a few shoulda, coulda, woulda if in in the sort of what we like might have done a bit differently or been able to sort of do differently to improve it. Yeah. It's it seems really interesting. I mean, to look at the the 2019 result because I, I seem to recall you had a really good first heat in that. In yeah, that we did. Yeah, yeah. Regatta, yeah. and you, you were kind of on for winning it potentially. Yeah. So the bronze medal must have been yeah. disappointed. I know Jurgen was. Jurgen took the blame himself for that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, um, I think we maybe just sort of came off the boil a little bit between the heat and the. In the final, which was probably, I think, because we obviously won our heat. I think, I think we beat the Dutch in the heat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You know, we're on here, us and the Germans. Um, we just sort of like took our eye off the ball, or you know, the lack of experience of when you race the eight. It's a long, long time if you win your heat till the final. Um, so yeah, I think that was obviously just a bit disappointing um, in that progression then, but. Uh, I think when we actually came back to race, okay, we learned from that. And I know we had that year away where we all just sort of like trained by ourselves, but um, we'd learned a lot from that 2019 year. And it looked like Europeans, obviously one Europeans, one Lucerne, and it was like, here yeah. we go, we're, we're, in the right, we're in the right place. And, and those learnings have been really, really good. Yeah. So when you look back at the Olympics, the Olympic experience, you know, now, uh, what yeah. goes through your mind? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm an Olympian. That's pretty cool. Um, I won a medal. A lot of people would sort of bite your hand off to win a medal, I think. Yeah. But ultimately, you're always, like, we were disappointed not to win it. Um, but then the Kiwis better than us. We didn't beat them ever. Um, they beat us three times. Um and so they deserve to win it. A uh, bit disappointed to lose to Germany, having beaten them twice in that season. I think mm. that that that's one that's definitely hard. Um, but I think, yeah, the way the regatta went for us, actually, ultimately, you'd look at it and go, that was quite a good result because I don't think our prep for that regatta was perfect. Um, but I think, yeah, we probably got what we deserved and like we were... Maybe a bit, like maybe quite lucky to actually win a medal. So you've got to, you know, be sort of like happy with that sometimes. Um, obviously, it's disappointing. Like you wanted to win, we wanted to win the Olympics, and I think we, in throughout the season, has set ourselves up to do so. But you know, one of the things I sort of learned when I was there is that the Olympics is just like a pressure dealing, like dealing yeah. with pressure, we deal with pressure, and like we didn't do it as well as the Kiwis, and we didn't do it as well as the Germans, and so and that was reflected in the results. Um, this might be an unfair question and just throw it back at me if you think it is. Um, how do you think you'd have got on if Jürgen had been coaching you? Uh, yeah, I can't, I don't know. I don't think I should, I, I can't answer that. No, um, fair enough. Like, uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, I get on really well with Jürgen and I still do to this day and, you know, I talk to him quite a lot and uh, um, I definitely see Jürgen as like a big mentor and a very influential part of my own career. Um Obviously, changes were made um, in the end at the end of the 2020 lockdown, and um, Stevie T is a fantastic coach and, and did a great job. So um, it's not. I, I think it's hard to say like it would have been better, but obviously, I guess Jurgen has a proven track record, especially at the Olympic Games. Yeah, and I think that we, especially in the way that there were no crowds and it was a bit quite quite a bubble, um, you know, that experience probably would have been very 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 valuable. Yeah, yeah. But again, it, again, it's a big shit he could have would have and um, yeah. what we could have done differently. I gather Jürgen was quite supportive of you going to Cambridge. Yeah, I actually called him when I got in um, because obviously I got in when we were in Varese before the Olympics. So quite ah. late. Quite late. Um, we were in Varese, we were about to go to Silverette and then we were coming home for a bit and then going to Tokyo. And so, uh, obviously, at the time, I was like, cool, I've just got to shelve that and just forget about it. It's not really important right now. Like, I spoke with, with Bakes, um, just been like, I got in, let's talk after we've raced at the Olympics. Uh, obviously, talked to my parents um, a bit about it. And then it was like, right, it's not really important. Then when, you, when we didn't win the Olympics, I was kind of like, I don't really know if this is the right decision, if I want to carry on rowing. Um, so I called Jürgen 
just as the man to talk to. Ah. Um, just like talked it out with him. Um, and he sort of asked me why I wanted to go. And we talked about like the strengths of going, the, like the positives of going and, and, and reasons that like, that, well, it ended up being a very short list of reasons why I wouldn't go. Um, and he just sort of said, he was like, Tommy, you've always been someone that's been um, interested in, in like other things that's around rowing and always been like keeping busy around rowing. I think you should go. I think it'd be really good for you. And obviously Ollie was coming too. Um, and Ollie was still on stroke side at that point, but he was just like, there are two of you going. See, that was a great opportunity to just like go away and train really well. Yeah. And play a bit different and just like keep yourself fresh. So yeah, it was I, one of those conversations that, yeah, obviously when Jürgen said that to me, it was just like, okay, well, obviously I'm going to go. So, yeah. You know, like, um, uh, yeah. And, and it was, it's always nice to be able to like fall back on people like that when you don't really know where to turn and when you're not really sure how you feel and you never want to make a decision like after the Olympics based on the emotion of how the Olympics went for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like, I'm very grateful to Jürgen for like taking the time to like sit down with me and talk those things out. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Oh, so Pat, Pat Keelty, here's a quick question. Um, how did you decide who would change sides is a good one. I'd never thought of that. Yeah, uh, that was actually Baker. Um, well, uh, it was sort of a, we had a conversation and, you know, Ollie always gives me shit. I can't say that. I don't know if I say Sorry. Ollie always gives me shit. <laughs> but he, basically, we sat down with, um, uh, with Bakes and, and Bakes was like, look, on one short on bow side, we had four stroke siders uh, who had all raced internationally, like senior international level. And we had one or two bow siders who were the bow, yeah, or one bow sider. And, you know, um, and so it was like, I need one of these swap sides. He was just like, for the bow race, we need one of these swap sides. I don't really necessarily see this as like a um, permanent thing, but I think you should do it. I think one of you should do it. And then, he was sort of like, and before we discuss it, I also think it would work in a pair. And sort of this is why. And he pulled up like telemetry curves and showed us like how matched up our curves were together. Yeah. And then he was like, I think that um, there's an opportunity here that you guys probably don't see yet and we don't really need to think about yet. But it's something we should consider. Um, and we sat there and we had this sort of moment where we were like looking at each other and <laughs> I basically just sort of, you know, I was just like, um, it's not going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> And I was, I, I was like, I just, I just don't think, I've always gone to the right. I've always gone out to the right side. I don't know if my body would have been able to do it with my, my hip. Like, horrible. And he, like, Ollie, absolute hero, was just like, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and also, I think Ollie, I didn't know this at the time, but Ollie had spoken to Bakes before, being like, should yeah. I swap sides? And Rob had been like, been like, oh, maybe, not sure. Like, let's just leave it how it is for now. So Ollie had already sort of discussed that op option. Um, and I think it turned out that like, um, I don't know, I think Ollie rose very well on bow side. I thought he, you know, like a duck to water. So, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and I saw the rest of his history, but like, yeah, I definitely was, you know, not massively cooperative in that sort of, uh, in that. And uh, Ollie sort of fully dived on the grenade and took it on and, and absolutely nailed it. So uh, yeah. I'm just grateful to him for that because obviously, Pair went pretty well. Um, yeah. I hope we get to race it again because it's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. Um, I was trying to think in terms of relationships of, of rowing, um, uh, your relationship with Ollie is quite unique. I mean, you know, the the, the sort of pairs, partners, you, you get sort of Pinsent and Redgrave, Pinsent and Cracknell maybe yeah. uh, to a lesser extent. Um, how would you describe your relationship with Ollie? Yeah, I mean, just like very good. Uh, <laughs> it, running together since we were 16. So, um, oh, we, Cross it, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, good. Um, so just froze. So, 16, and we've like rode together in boats, and then um, it's always been. years in the states when we were on different teams racing against each other but we'd still be on the same team doing under 23 stuff and um yeah and then we obviously lived together when we came back from the states and and uh yeah i think just like it's pretty cool isn't it that you get to do that and then i guess the becomes even cooler when ollie swapped sides and then it was like well why don't you try and do the pair and then 
and when I actually went well it was like wow this is actually like quite special um, and being able to do that with Ollie was, was really really cool yeah yeah sounds like there's unfinished business in the pair for you yeah I'd love to keep raising the pair I think um, obviously kind of like the Olympics I'd say on the day we weren't the best boat but like we won our semi we showed that like when we're there when we get it right we're um, one of the fastest pairs if not the fastest pair in the world I think um, the Romanians are obviously really, really good, absolute quality outfit, and um, uh, really enjoyed being able to race them this year. And and the Spanish guys, obviously, it's a bit annoying because we've like, beaten them all year. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, we learned a lot. Obviously, Oli was still relatively new to bow side. Um, we'd only been rowing the pair since after the boat race. So, um, what's that? Mid April um, through, and then like I think. Just the way the season was set up for us, like every race was sort of a selection race. And so um, I really would like the opportunity to be able to just like hunker down in the pair and actually just like crush a load of training throughout like the winter and be like, okay, you guys are going to do this. And like back in you, we're taking all the pressure off you guys. It's just like, go do it. And and knowing that not every race is going to be perfect um, and learning how to like perform when it, it maybe isn't perfect. Whilst I think actually last year it was like, go to Belgrade, that's the selection race. Go to hand this selection race. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to tell what's the you in chat, much like, um, you know, where, like, wh where do we go from here? It's like, it's getting harder and harder every time to look like make be like every single race is a final. Um, and I think, uh, it would just be really cool to be able to like play around a little bit and know that. In, and, and get a bit more experience because I think probably in the final like, in the final of the world I'd be like we lost it in the first 25 strokes um, and it'd just be like well let's just improve that if we can improve that we know we, you know we, we had the fastest middle K in every race that we did bar that final um, so we know we've got really good cruising speed um, we're the fastest first 500 in in uh, no it's, we're in the top two fastest first 500s every other race every race we did so it's just about like, you know, getting that experience and understanding how to race the pair. Um, yeah. And there's a really cool opportunity there. Um, obviously, you know, we'd go where we put and we'll fall in line to where, where we, the, the coaches want us. Obviously, like I want to be in the fastest boat I can be in, I want to win the Olympics. So it's not necessarily about always, um, like it's not something I'm going to be like demanding, but like I really want to have the opportunity to like express that and try that out in the pair. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it'd be cool. Um, I kind of think with Olympic qualification, you, you'd be the obvious two to put in a pair because you want to make sure that boat's qualified this year. Didn't qualify in Tokyo. Yeah. 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 I, 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 yeah, I guess I, I'd agree. I think the, the team is in a very different place maybe to where it was in 2019. So I fully back anyone in the team to get the top 11 in the pair. So um, in that regard, I think, um, like the team I, I don't think it's necessarily should be like the motivating factor I think there's some absolute quality athletes in the GB team at the moment but yeah, um, yeah I mean I'd love the opportunity to just like go out and have another go in the pair and see um, but similarly I've never raced before at senior international level so it'd be really cool to to do that and obviously it's like sort of a bit, bit of history in that and like British history mm. in that being able to maybe do that as well as something that potentially is very exciting so yeah I'm, ve I'm very open to, to wherever um, is deemed best like I said it's about winning the Olympics and it's about like getting not just like personally but getting like GB as the team back to like the top of the medal medal table because I think that's sort of where where it's always like being historically and where we can we have the guys to get back there now yeah I mean your semi-final race at the Worlds was epic I thought the way you dealt yeah. with the Romanians I almost think you know if you hadn't have had that good a race in the semi-final you might have had a different sort of first 25 strokes in the final yeah I think I'd probably agree with you I think um, we, we kind of said after it we kind of became like the glass ball of like don't drop the glass ball and I think that ultimately comes down to the inexperience that I sort of talked about of like we've only, that was like the first time we'd really raced the pair that's last season it was the first time we'd been yeah, um, yeah just like in that combination um, I think that semi-final was really, really cool. I thought we actually just dictated every stroke of the race. Um, and from the K onwards, I think we were just pretty insane. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. So, like, um, yeah, I'd agree. I think that um, it's probably one race too far. 
in terms of like the way the season had been and, and the way that um, we'd sort of set ourselves up. But um, it's all part of the learning curve and, and I think that there's more to come uh, in that regard and, and we can like take that learning with us to go forward. I mean, you had to really work your asses off to get that bronze medal though, didn't you, in the last 500 metres? Yeah. I think the Serbs yeah. were there, were they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin, yeah. I know them quite well as well. So, um, I, I think, yeah, we did. We left a lot to do when it didn't click in and it didn't go that well. I think we were both just kind of like searching to try and find out the best way to like get it right. Um, and maybe as a result of that, came apart from each other a bit more. Yeah. So we had like a weird period of time where like the start wasn't terrible, but obviously wasn't perfect. And then I think we kind of pulled ourselves apart a little bit to then come back together. Um, unfortunately, we sort of did click back in together towards the end and that was important. But yeah, um, really had to like dig deep. Uh, yeah, a bit of character. But I, mean, I guess like we knew that we were a good outfit. We knew that we were a good pair. Um, and I think you just got to like trust the process. Um, and I think that's what we didn't do from about 200 to six or 700 in that race was trust the process. And then when we started to trust the process of what we'd done all season and like all those long sessions with Bakes and all those like pieces we've done in Ely and, you know, the long, long, like 24 K rows where mm -hmm. we just bang out, bang it back. Um, it was just like a lot had gone into that and a lot had gone into getting to that point. And so, yeah, when, when it did come back together, obviously that was great and, and we dug really deep and it was like ultimately pretty proud of the way that we raced that because we were down and out ultimately and, and we, we yeah. that. and that was that was you know that was good. Um obviously we're competitive athletes, we're we're you know, top top athletes. We wanna always be pushing for the top top of the podium rather than just like, yeah, we raced really well to get bronze, but at the same time, you've got to race the race that's there. And, and by the time yeah. we got to the last 500, the race that was there was against the Serbians and it was about getting that back. Mm. Um, Giovanni Ippolito has come up with a question. Uh, I presume you might not know as some of maybe some of the British viewers uh, about the names of all the guys. Obviously, there, there are a few that did really well at the World Championships. Um, are you able to talk to that question? Uh yeah, I, I think I just think the whole the whole squad at the moment, um, everyone who's a part of the team at the moment, and even the guys that like didn't go to Worlds last year have already like come back in and are you know pushing hard to to get back into the team. So I think yeah, just like the whole of that eight, the whole of that four spare guys, yeah, on every every single. Per I don't think I think there's a single person there that I'd be like, oh, yeah. Apart from yourself and Ollie, is there anyone that stands out for you? In terms of you know absolute performer, uh, I, yeah, I think there, there's a lot of high performers in the team. You know, it was like demonstrating the fact that won, we won gold in the four and the eight. Yeah, all those guys, all those guys are like high performers who like love to love to get after it and love to race. So uh, yeah. So your opposition in the boat race and and former schoolboy at Radley, Charlie yeah. Elwes. I mean, yeah. he often is a name that people throw out there as, as an outstanding rower. Yeah. Yeah. He's phenomenal. Obviously like, and I think his record sort of speaks for itself that, yeah, he's uh, obviously won a shed load of stuff out of Yale and then came back and, and obviously is like, was part of the eight in Tokyo. And then it's like, yeah, won the boat race, beat us in the boat race. So yeah, it's always a, but then, um, yeah, when I wanted to win the world championship, so, you know, he's a world champion. Uh, row and I think that's like yeah phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a few things um, I was going to ask you about um, that, that have just uh, come to mind during the time we've been talking. Um, I wondered about Cambridge. If if Cambridge changed you as a person, your experience at all? Uh, I think you realise that there's um, there's a lot going on uh like around you and that it's quite easy sometimes to get sucked into the bubble that is is elite rowing and that sometimes just like it's important to like st step back and just like observe a little bit from the outside and, and uh not necessarily on the rowing but just like yeah and Cambridge like provided those opportunities to be able to like those sort of welcome distractions I guess almost and then I think that's something I'll like carry forward with me for the next few years especially while I'm still rowing but it's just like there's a lot there's a lot going on out there and it's quite fun to be able to like remove yourself from the direct focus of rowing and, and be able to um, experience other things. And, and sometimes it's like, important to be able to kick back and switch off. You don't always need to be mm. just completely obsessed. Um, yeah. 
And talk to me about James Cracknell and his contribution yeah. to oh. rowing. Yeah, I I I love crackers. I think he's great. Um, I know that he wears his heart on his sleeve, and and especially you know he just wants the team to do really well, and he absolutely loves um, loves it when the team team is doing well. And uh, he became quite a good mentor actually to Ollie and I, and, and and he actually lives up the road from me now, so I see him a bit. Um, yeah, and uh, it's just like always nice to catch up with him and just like pick his brains a little bit. Uh, he's obviously been through it himself. And has had like the sort of adversity and the ups and downs of, of injuries and sort of missing Olympic and, and so it's always nice to get a bit of his perspective and a bit of like his view on things. Um, yeah, really like working with Crackers, um, and I hope yeah I'll obviously just like stay in touch with him throughout the next like couple of years, like throughout the rest of my rowing career because it's always nice to be able to fall back on on his advice. Yeah, does he still go up and help coach at Cambridge? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think he's going up there as much this year. It, like last year, obviously he was coming up every weekend. Um, I think he's still doing a bit, but I think he's more and more um, just like helping out on Tideway weekends when when the team come down to train on the Tideway. Um, yeah, and like that's more his domain now. Obviously, with uh, being based in London, it's a bit easier for him. Yeah, um, I was. I was also going to ask you about the boat race, the nerves for the boat race, because yeah. obviously it was just such an epic race um, yeah. last year with two of the most fantastic crews ever. Um, and it was your first time on the boat race start, and people always talk about nerves on the boat race start. I know you've done a lot of preparation for that uh, as part of your training. How, how was yeah. it for you on the on the start this year? Um, I think it's just very different to any other own race because you have this like obviously you come out of the boat bays and people are like I mean you come out down a tunnel that's like two meters wide and then either side of you it's just like thousands of people yelling so that's like a big adrenaline spike and then you sort of go and warm down warm up even through the bridges and it's just very quiet and you know there's and so it's quite weird in that regard because you kind of like go up and down whilst obviously when you boat for the Olympics you boat out of the like Boat, boating area but there are no mm. fans in the area then you sort of went around to the far, you go around to the far side and you go up the warm-up lane and you don't really see any fans and you only really mm. see them once you're in the last 500 meters of the race so it sort of builds through um so it's definitely different obviously also just like the whole way down the course you're just aware that there are just so many people yelling it's so loud mm. you've got the drones flying overhead and you sort of knew because you're sitting on the start line and the tide is ripping through. So you start with like your blade sort of inverse. Yeah. And then. Uh, the head and it's just like wearing away. And you're like, okay. Yeah. But yeah, just like, um, definitely. Yeah. Obviously. Sitting on the. It's always, it's not horrible. You kind of enjoy that experience. You know, you definitely have those moments where you're like what the hell am I doing but yeah you know it was one of those things we trained for and wanted to be a part of and, and being a part of that history and that boat race it's just it's very cool and being a part of like the CBC yeah yeah do you have rituals yeah. for dealing with nerves uh not really because I'm like yeah yeah you, you, you've got to kind of be expect and be ready for and know that they're going to come because if you're not nervous on the start line, you're going to lose the race already. So, um, yeah, you sit there. I think for me, I'm always just like, okay, I've done the work. I'm sort of comes back to the same um, where I'm at. So, therefore, I'm calm. I'm calm. Heart rate is very elevated. And it's just like, yeah, um, got to sort of be familiar with it and, and understand it but I don't think it, I don't really have any rituals um, have you read the inner game of tennis do you know the book the inner game of tennis yeah yeah I know that one two and, and the idea of like yeah. um, ignoring your ego and, and uh, Timothy Galway was it yeah and uh, I think I always think about try and do something like stupid that's that So, yeah, um, trust the rhythm, trust self too. Yeah. There yeah. you go. One thing I was going to ask you is, is what's your heart rate going at when you're 
max. And how much do you so trade off it? One ninety. Uh, so one ninety is that my one ninety one ninety one something like that. Uh, yeah, I think it does. Uh, it's like one nine three, and I think that's like my peak. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We, so then I just. So. Were you lactate tested after your 5K ergo test? No, no, no. It's been fascinating. What? I kind of, yeah, yeah. I was, rolling around was, the floor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so um, you were you were on the front of row three sixty, very uh, striking cover last year. Um, yeah. How did that come about? Oh, it's T ran. Yeah, that was that was a Ramsey <laughs> special. He uh, he definitely definitely. I'm not sure whether he'd seen it, but he and Ben Tufnell were just like, "This is what we're thinking. This is what we want to do." Um, and then they were like, "If you don't want to, don't worry about it." And so we kind of like to, did some other stuff, and then it was like actually why not? Let's just try it and see if it looks cool. And then I guess the photo looked pretty cool. So they were like, let's go. We want to go with this one. And, and, and there it was. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was quite funny. We had, they came down to Ely and we sort of had the interview and then I did a load of photos. And then there was one period of time where t Ram was sort of standing in the water, like treading water, trying to figure <laughs> out the right depth. And that was quite funny. Just like seeing him just like there being like, I think it's about here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pretty epic photo. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, I guess it. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I thought it actually looked pretty good when it came yeah. out. I guess the opportunities for you to dress up in a tux uh, are, are quite few and far between, really, or have been yeah. quite few and far between. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I mean, what, once a year maybe. And if you win a medal, you get to go. We went to Sports Personality of the Year, obviously. Uh, oh, how was that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Worthy enough, yeah. Have a good time. Obviously, the lionesses were there this year in force, which was really cool, and they were like they were very game to have a good evening. So that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it, you know, yeah. And you get to have a good time and uh, and yeah, enjoy enjoy yourself as a team. And it's sort of a pre Christmas time where you can just let your hair down a bit. Yeah, that must feel really good. I guess you must have one of the things of being in the uni in the states and your term time of training is that you, you must have uh, missed quite a lot of social functions and things like that. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. I think, I think um, that's sort of all part of it though, isn't it? Uh, that, you know, you kind of have to decide at some point if you, what you want to do, are you going to like try and win the Olympics? You can't be like doing everything, every social function. It's always nice to be able to do a couple, but you kind of need to be able to like draw a line under it once you've done a couple. And it's like, yeah, I'm not sitting standing here, but you're sitting here being like, you need to miss, you should miss every single. Um, yeah, I'm not, what's me? There you go. Yeah. Um, you, I'm not standing here, so you need to. And, um, and it's always sad, and there are certain ones that come up that you do miss, and they, they really hurt when you do, but like you also can't be going to every single one that comes up. Um, yeah. So there's definitely an element of like picking and choosing, and I think that the balance is really important. I think it is really important to have like a. Uh, the opportunity to do that especially in um during you know the early parts of the season but also you need to like there definitely there's definitely like a point in the season at which i think you just need to sort of hunker down and be like okay i unfortunately can't do this um and it sucks yeah. and i missed one of my best mates from princeton's wedding last year um it was after the boat race before trials and it was just like unfortunately this isn't going to work and and that yeah. was really, that was obviously really really tough because those are people who have been like a big part of your life in a big part of your like formative years. And yeah. uh, so that was obviously absolutely horrific. And um, yeah, I need to, I still need to make it up to him by going out and seeing him in California and, and catching up with him and uh, having a beer with him. But um, I'm sure that there'll be a lot of opportunities to do that down the line. Yeah. Do you make any new year's resolutions? Uh, not specifically, no. I'm no, 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 not like any that I was like, oh, I need to hold myself to this. I guess I was just like, you know, um, I don't, I don't know if I like necessarily buy into the new year, new me thing. I think we like, yeah, especially with what we do. So like you're always just trying to like get a bit better every day. And so, 
the idea that like the first of January comes along and then it's like that'll do. It just never really works. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Um so listen, so often, you know. listen, I'm mindful you've got uh travel tomorrow. I don't know whether you've packed all your bags still or you've got stuff to do, but um yeah. I'm, I'm mindful yeah. of the fact you spent an hour on Crossy's Corner where you might no, have yeah, Crossy's been, been an absolute pleasure. You know, you've been... seen some difficult questions came in, you know, and I know that uh, you wanted me to spill the beans, but yeah. yeah, that's typical. That's that's yeah. that's great. It's 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 been absolutely fantastic, TG. Really brilliant. Um, Thank you so much and for me, Martin. I really appreciate it. I'd say have a good time on camp, but I'm not sure you will. But oh, I will make the best of it. Yeah, I mean, I will make the best of it. It'll be it will be good fun. I think you know you go away and you have those like. I, know, I kind of call them like camp goggles where you go on camp and because you're training somewhere different, you're able to like push on a little bit. It's, quite, it's a bit different. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that'll last about four days and then I'll realise it's absolutely biblical, but that's, that's all sort of part of the fun. So yeah. Magic. Right, yeah. we'll end the live part of this interview now. Thanks everyone for watching and thanks Tom. Cheers Martin. Thank you. See you. Bye.